Hello everyone, it's me Shay and we are back for Shay Story Show and we are going to continue reading Wind Up Girl. Um, basically my favorite book. Really, really good book. I'm so glad I got a hold of it. And um, for those of you who have not caught uh, my previous streams uh, for this show, um, Wind Up Girl is as I hear, biopunk, which is um, interesting. I just kind of went, went with like post-apocalyptic, like steampunk, near future kind of stuff. But um, it is it is uh, set in a near future that has big companies corrupt companies and uh, calories are currency and um, there's genetic engineering all over and um, this book in particular takes place in Bangkok. Uh, sea levels have risen so it's technically below the sea level but they have these big walls that keep the water out. Um, last time we met we met the Tiger of Bangkok and his lieutenant. JD is the Tiger of Bangkok and his lieutenant JD. Who have ended up who are very much of the opinion that they don't like they don't like foreign companies bringing in strange things and there's various diseases and all this stuff. When we met a few of the good, some few of the characters in the first one, um, namely Anderson, uh, Anderson Lake, who's one of the company men. Um, there was, uh, uh, hmm. there was Emiko, the wind-up girl, with whom this book is based after or named after, I guess I should say. But I'm going to go ahead and get back into the book. Uh, if you have not seen the first the first two episodes of me reading, uh, or have not heard the first two episodes, go ahead and go ahead and listen to those because it'll give a lot of a lot of uh, a lot more detail on this setting. So, without further ado, we are on chapter eight, I believe. Without further ado. Let's do further. Uh -huh. Let me share my own. Okay. Just want to make sure I'm on the right chapter. I lost thirty thousand fifty auto mutters. Lucy Nguyen stares at the ceiling. 185? Six? 400. Quill Napier sets his warm glass of Sato down on the low table. I lost 400,000 blue bills on Carlisle's goddamn dirigible. The entire table falls silent, stunned. Christ. Lucy sits up, weary with drink in the middle of the afternoon. What were you smuggling in? CV resistant seed stock? The conversationalists sprawl on the veranda of Sir Francis Drake's light positioning. The conversationalists sprawl on the veranda of Sir Francis Drake's, all five together. The Farang Phalanx, as Lucy styled them. All of them, stare, all of them staring out at the dry season blast furnace and drinking themselves into a stupor. Anderson reclines with them, half listening to their slurred complaints as he turns the problem of the Nall's origins over in his mind. He's got another bag of the fruit between his feet he can't help thinking that the answer to his puzzle lies close. If only he had sufficient ingenuity to suss it out. 
He drinks warm, chim, warm Khmer whiskey and ponders. No. Apparently impervious to blister rust and sebaciosis, even when directly exposed. Obviously resistant to Nippon Jinhak weevil and and leaf curl, or it could never have grown. Perfect product. The fruit, the fruit of access to a different to different genetic material than Averagen and the rest of the calorie companies use for the air chain ripping. Somewhere in this country, a seed bank is hidden. Thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, of carefully preserved seeds, a treasure trove, trove of biological diversity, infinite chains of DNA, each of their own potential uses. And from this gold mine, the ties are extracting answers to their naughtiest challenges of survival. With access to the tie seed bank, Des Moines could mine genetic code for generations, beat back plague mutations, stay alive a little longer. Anderson shifts in his seat, stifling irritation, wiping away sweat. He's so close. Nightshades have been reborn, and now no and Gibbons is running loose in Southeast Asia. If it weren't for that illegal wind-up girl, he wouldn't even know about Gibbons. The kingdom has been singularly successful at maintaining its operational security if he could just ascertain the seed bank's location. A raid might even be possible. They've learned since Finland. Beyond the veranda, nothing with any intelligence is moving. Tantalizing beads of sweat run down Lucy's neck and soak her shirt as she complains about the state of the Cold War with the Vietnamese. She can't hunt for jade if the army is busy shooting anything that moves. Quill sideburns are matted. No breezes blow. Out in the street, rickshaw men huddle in thin pools of shade. Their bones and joints protrude from bare top skin. Skeletons with flesh stretched tight on their frames. At this time of day, they only sullenly emerge from shadow when they are called and then only for double fee. The entire ramshackle structure of the bar is scabbed to the outer wall of a wrecked expansion tower. A hand-painted sign leans against one of the stairs up to the veranda with the scrawled words, Sir Francis Drake's sign is a recent addition, relative to the decay and wreckage around it. Painted by a handful of Farang, determined to name their surroundings. The fools who did the naming long ago disappeared up, up the country, either swallowed in the jungle as blister rust rewrites swept over them, or torn apart in the tangle of war, war lines over coal and jane, jade. Still, the sign remains, either because it amuses the owner, who has taken the name on as the nickname, or because no one can summon the energy to paint over it. In the meantime, it peels in the heat. Regardless of provenance, Drake is, perf is perfectly placed between the seawall, shipping locks, and the factories. Its dilapidated wreckage faces off across the Victory Hotel so the Farang fa Phalanx can drink its stupid, drink itself stupid and watch to see if any new foreigners of interest have washed up on the shores. There are other lower dives for the sailors who manage to pass customs and quarantine and wash down, but it is here with the snapping white tablecloths of the, of the Victory on one side of the cobbled street and Sir Francis bamboo slum on the other, where those foreigners who settle in Bangkok for any length of time eventually sink. What were you shipping? Lucy asks, asks again, prodding Quill to explain his losses. Quill leans forward and lowers his voice, encouraging all of them to rouse them, themselves. Saffron, from India. A pause and then Cobb laughs. Good airlift product. I should have thought of that. Ideal for a dirigible. Low weight and more profitable than opium on the uplift. 
Quill says. The kingdom still hasn't figured out how to how to crack the siege stock, and all the politicians and generals want it for their household kitchens. Lots of face if they can get it. I had a solid I had solid pre orders. I was going to be rich. Unbelievably rich. I ruined then. Maybe not. I'm negotiating with three Ganasha insurance. They might cover some. Quill shrugs. Well, 80%. But all the bribes to get into this country, all the payoffs to the custom agents, he makes a face. That's a complete loss. Still, I might get out with my skin. In a way, I got lucky. The shipment only falls under insurance guidelines because it's still on Carlisle's dirigible. I ought to toast that damn pilot for getting himself drowned in the ocean. If they unloaded the cargo and the white shirts had burned it to the ground, it would have been classified contraband. Then I'd be out there, on the street, with the Fagon beggars and yellow cards. Auto scouts. That's about the only thing to be said for Carlisle. If he wasn't so interested in touching politics, none of this would have happened. Quill shrugs. We don't know that. It's, it's damn certain, Lucy interjects. Carlisle spends half his energy complaining about... Whoops. Carlisle spends half his energy complaining about the white shirts, and the other half cozying up with Akarat. It's a message from General Praka to Carlisle and the Trade Ministry. We're just the carrier pigeons. Carrier pigeons are extinct. You think we won't be? General Praka would be Pracha would be happy to throw every one of us into Klong Prim prison if he thought it would send the right message to Akarat. Her gaze swings to Anderson. You're off with Quiet Lake. You don't lose anything at all. Anderson stirs himself. Manufacturing materials. Replacement parts for my line. Probably a hundred fifty thousand blue bills. My secretary is still evaluating, evaluating the damage. He glances at Quill. Our stuff was on the ground. No insurance. The memory of his conversation with Hawk Sin is still fresh. Hawk Sin first played at denial, complaining of incompetence at the anchor pads before finally confessing that everything was lost and that he had failed to pay all the bribe money in the first place. An ugly confessional. Almost hysterical. The old man, terrified of losing his job, and Anderson pressing him further and further into his fear, humiliating him and shouting at him, making the old man cower, making a point of his displeasure. Still, he can't help wondering if the lesson has been learned, or if Hawksang will try to be tricky again. Anderson grimaces. If the old man didn't free up so much of Anderson's time for more important work, he shipped the old bastard back to the yellow card towers. I told you this was a stupid place to run a factory, Lucy says. The Japanese do it. Only because they have special arrangements with the palace. The Chaozu Chinese. The Chaozu. Yeah, the Chao. I'm going to pronounce this correctly. The Chaozu Chinese do just fine too. Lucy makes a face. They've been here for generations, practically Thai at this point. We're more like yellow cards than Chao Tzu. If you want to make comparisons, a smart a s if you want to make comparisons, a smart Farang knows not to keep too much invested in this place. The ground's always shifting. It's too damn easy to lose everything and then crack down or another coup. We all work with the hands we're dealt, Anderson shrugs. Anyway, Yates chose the site. I told Yates it was stupid, too. Anderson recalls Yates. Eyes bright with the possibility of a new global economy. Maybe not stupid, but definitely an idealist. He finishes his drink. The bar owner is nowhere in sight. He waves to the waiters, who all ignore him. One of them, at least, is asleep, standing. 
You're not worried you'll get yanked the way Yates did, Lucy asks. Anderson shrugs. Wouldn't it be the worst thing that could happen? It's damn hot. He touches his sunburned nose. I'm more of a northern waste sort. Nguyen and Quill, dark-skinned both, laugh at that. But Otto just nods grimly, his own peeling nose a testament to his inability to adapt to the, to the burn of the equatorial sun. Lucy pulls out a pipe, pushing a couple flies away before setting down her smoking tools and an accompanying ball of opium. The flies hobble away, but don't take to the air. Even the bugs seem stunned by the heat. Down an alley, near the rubble of an old expansion tower, children are playing next to a freshwater pump. Lucy watches them as she, as she tamps her pipe. Christ, I wish I was a kid again. Everyone seems to have lost the energy for conversation. Anderson pulls the sack of gnaw out from between his feet, takes one out, feels it, pries the translucent fruit from the gnaw's interior, and tosses the hairy hollow rind on the table, pops the fruit into his mouth. Otto cocks his head, curious. What's that you got? Anderson digs more out of the sack, distributes them. Not sure. Ties call them gnaw. Lucy stops tamp tamping her pipe. I've seen them. They're all over the market. They don't have blister us? Anderson shakes his head. Not so far. The lady who sold them said they were clean, had, certificate, had the certificates. Everyone laughs, but Anderson shrugs off their cynicism. I let them sit for a week. Nothing. They're cleaner than you, Tex. The others follow his lead and eat their own fruits. Eyes by them. Smiles appear. Anderson opens the sack wide and sets it on the table. Go ahead. I've been eating too many as it is. They all rifle the bag. A pile of rinds grows as grows in the center of the table. Quill chews thoughtfully. It sort of reminds me of Ichi. Oh, Anderson controls his interest. Never heard of it. Sure, I had a drink that tasted a bit like it. Last time I was in India, Kolkata, a pure cow sales rep, took me to one of his restaurants when I first started looking at shipping saffron. So you think this is a lychee? Could be. Lychee was what he called the drink. Might not have been the fruit at all. If it's a pure cow product, I don't see how it would show up here, Lucy says. These should all be out on Coangrit under quarantine while the Environment Ministry finds 10,000 different ways to tax the thing. She spits the pit into her palm and tosses it off the balcony into the street. I'm seeing these everywhere. They've got to be local. She reaches into the sack, takes another. You know who might know about them, though? She leans back and calls into the dimness of the bar. Hag, you still there? You awake back there? At the man's name, the others stir and try to straighten themselves like children caught by a strict parent. Anderson forces down an instinctive chill. I wish he hadn't done that, he mutters. Otto grimaces. I thought he died. Blister us never gets the chosen ones, don't you know? Everyone stifles a laugh as a form shambles out of the gloom. Hag's face is flushed, and sweat speckles his face. He surveys the phalanx solemnly. Hello, all. He nods his head to Lucy. Still trafficking with these sort, then? Lucy shrugs. I may do. She nods at a chair. Don't just stand there. Have a drink with us. Tell us your stories. She lights her opium pipe and draws on it as the man pulls up a chair beside her and sags into it. Hag is a solid man, well fleshed. Not for the not for the first time Anderson thinks how interesting it is that Grahamite priests of all their flock are always the ones whose waistlines overflow their niche. niche. 
Hag waves her whiskey and surprises everyone when a waiter appears at his elbow almost immediately. Nice, the waiter says on arrival. Mm, no, no ice, of course not. Hag shakes his head emphatically. Don't want the damn calories spent anyway. When the waiter returns, Hag takes the drink and downs it instantly. Then sends the waiter back for a second. It's good to be back in from the countryside, he says. You start missing the pleasures of civilization. He toasts them all with, set, with his second glass and downs it as well. How far out were you? Lucy asks, the pipe clamped in her teeth. She's starting to look glassy glassy from the burning tar. Near the old border with Burma, and three pagodas pass. He looks sourly at all of them as they are guilty of the sins he researches. Looking into ivory beetle spread. Not safe up there, I heard, Otto says. Who's the Jaupur? A man named Shanarong, and he was no trouble at all. Far easier to work with him than the Dung Lord or any of the small Zhao poor in the city. Not all of the Godfathers are so focused on profits and power. Hag looks back pointedly. For those of us who aren't interested in pillaging the kingdom of coal or jade or opium, the countryside is safe enough. He shrugs. In any case, I was invited by Fra Kritipong to visit his monastery to observe the changes in ivory beetle behavior. He shakes his head. The devastation is extraordinary. Whole forests, with not a leaf on them. Kudzu, and nothing else. The entire overstory is gone. Timber fallen everywhere. Otto looks interested. Anything salvageable? Lucy gives him a look of disgust. It's ivory beetle, you idiot. No one around here wants that. Anderson asks, You say the monastery invited you up, even though you're a Grahamite. Fra Kritipong is enlightened enough to know that neither Jesus Christ nor the niche teachings are anathema to his kind. Buddhist and Grahamite values overlap in many ways, many areas. Noah and the martyr Frost Sue are entirely complementary figures. Anderson stifles a laugh. If your monk saw how Grahamites operate back home, he might see it differently. Hag looks offended. I'm not some preacher of field burnings. I'm a scientist. Didn't mean any offense. Anderson pulls out a gnaw, offers a tag. This might interest you. We just found them in the market. Hag eyes the knoll. Hag eyes the knoll, surprised. The market? Which one? All over, they see supplies. They showed up while they showed up while you were gone, Anderson says. Try it. They're not bad. Hag takes the fruit, studying it closely. Extraordinary. You know what they are you know what they are, Otto asks. Anderson peels another fruit for himself, but even as he does, he listens closely. He would never directly ask the question of a Grahamite, but he's perfect will perfectly willing to let others do the work. Quill thought, it, Quill thought it was a lychee, Lucy says. Is he right? No, not a lychee, that's for certain. Hag turns it in his hand. It looks like it could be something the old texts call a rambutan. Hag is thoughtful. Though, if I recall correctly, they're somewhat related. Rambutan. Anderson keeps his expression friendly and neutral. That's a funny name. Ties call them null. Hag eats the fruit, spits the fat pit into his palm, and examines the black seed, wet with his saliva. I wonder if it will breed true. You can put it in a flower pot and find out. Hag gives him an irritated look. 
If it doesn't come from a calorie company, it will breed. The ties don't make sterile gene rips. Anderson laughs. I didn't think the calorie companies made tropical fruits. They, they make pineapples. Right, forgot. Anderson waits. How do you know so much about, the, about fruits? I studied biosystems and ecology in Alabama at your university. That's your grandma at college, right? I thought you studied... I thought all you studied was how to, how to start a field burning. The others suck in their breath at the provocation, but Hag just looks back coldly. Don't bait me. I'm not that sort. If we're ever going to restore Eden, it would take the knowledge of the ages to accomplish it. Before I came over, I spent a year immersed in pre-contraction Southeast Asian and ecosystems. He reaches across and takes another fruit. This must gall the calorie companies. Lucy fumbles for another fruit. You think we you think we could fill a clipper ship with these and send them back across the water? You know, play calorie company in reverse. People would pay a fortune for them, I bet I'll bet. New flavor and all. Sell it as a luxury. Otto shakes his head. You'd have to, you'd have to convince them it's not blister rust tainted. The red skin will make people nervous. Hag nods his agreement. It's a route best not pursued. Let the calorie companies do it, Lucy points out. They ship seeds and food every, wherever they want. They're global. Why shouldn't we try the same? Because it goes against all the niche teachings, Hag says gently. The calorie companies have already earned their place in hell. There's no reason you should be eager to join them. Anderson laughs. Come on, Hag. You can't seriously be against a little entrepreneurial spirit. Lucy's onto something. We should even put our face on the side of the crates. He makes a sign of, the, of Grahamite blessing. You know, approved by the Holy Church and all that. Safe as soy pro, he grins. What do you think of that? I would never participate in such blasphemy, hag scowls. Food should come from the place of its origin and stay there. It shouldn't spread its time crisscrossing the spend its time crisscrossing the globe for the sake of profit. We went down that path once and it brought us to ruin. More niche teachings. Anderson peels another fruit. There must be a niche for money somewhere in the Grahamite orthodoxy. Your cardinals are fat enough. The teachings are sound, even if the flock strays. Hag stands abruptly. Thank you for the company. He frowns at Anderson, but reaches across the table and grabs one more fruit before stalking away. As soon as he gone, he's gone, everyone relaxes. Christ, Lucy, why'd you do that? Otto asks. The man creeps me out. He, I left the compact so I could get away from Grahamite priest looking over my shoulder. And you have to call one over? Quill nods morosely. I heard there's another priest here at the joint embassy now. They're everywhere, like maggots. Lucy waves at them. Toss me another fruit. They return to their gorging. Anderson watches them, curious to see if these well-traveled creatures will have any other di ideas about its provenance. The Rambutan is an interesting possibility, though. Already, despite the excuse me, already despite the bad news of of the about the destroyed algae tanks and nutrient cultures, the day is turning out better than expected. Rambutan. A word to send back to Des Moines and the researchers. A route of investigation into the origins of this mysterious botanical object. Somewhere, there will be a histor historical record of it. He'll have to go back to his books and see if he can find... Look, who's there? Quill mutters. Everyone turns. Richard Carlyle, in a perfectly pressed linen suit, is climbing the, is climbing the stairs. He takes off his hat, reaches the shade, fanning himself. I fucking hate that man, Lucy mutters. 
She fights another pipe. Draws hard. What's he smiling about? Otto asks. Oh, if I know. He lost a dirigible, didn't he? Carlyle pauses in the shade, scans the patrons across the room, nods at all of them. Pretty hot one. Pretty? Ah, what kind of voice does he have? Hmm. Pretty hot one. He calls out. Otto stares at him, red-faced and bullet-eyed and mutters. If it hadn't been for his fucking politicking, fucking pot, if it hadn't been for his fucking politicking, I'd be a rich man today. Don't be dramatic, Anderson pops another gnaw into his mouth. Lucy, give the man a puff of your pipe. I don't feel like having Sir Francis kick us out of the heat for bawling. Lucy's eyes have gone glassy with opium, but she waves the pipe in Otto's direction. Anderson reaches across and plucks it from her fingers and gives it to Otto before standing and picking up his empty glass. Anyone else wants something? Desultory, desultory shakes of the head. Carlisle, Carlisle grins as he arrives at the bar. You poor old Otto. You get, you get poor old Otto sorted out. Anderson glances back. Lucy's, Lucy smokes serious opium. I doubt I'll be able to walk, let alone fight anyone. Devil's drug that. Anderson toasts him with his empty glass. That and booze. He peers over the edge of the bar. Where the hell is Sir Francis? I thought you, I thought you were here to answer that question. I guess not, Anderson says. You lose much? Some. Really? You don't seem bothered? Anderson gestures back at the rest of the phalanx. Everyone else is pissing and moaning about how you keep interfering with politics, cozying up with Akarat in the trade ministry, but here you are, smiling ear to ear. You could be a tie. Carlisle shrugs. Sir Francis, elegantly dressed, carefully coiffed, emerges from the back room. Carlisle asks for whiskey, and Anderson holds up his own empty glass. No eyes, Sir Francis. Mm, no ice, Sir Francis said. The, the, mo the mooly men want more money to run the pump. Pay them, then. Sir Francis shakes his head as he takes Anderson's glass. If you bargain when they squeeze your balls, they will only squeeze again, and I cannot bribe the Environment Ministry to give me access to the coal grid like you Ferrang. He turns away and pulls down a bottle of, of Khmer whiskey. Pours, pours an immaculate shot. Anderson wonders if any of the rumors about the man are true. Otto, now mumbling incoherently about, about fugging dirigibles, claims that Sir Francis was an old Chao Praia, a high assistant to the crown forced out of the pal palace in a power play. This theory has as much merit as the idea that he is a former servant of the Dung Lord, retired, or that he is a Khmer prince, displaced and living incognito ever since the Thai kingdom was enlarged to swallow the east. Everyone agrees that he must have been high rank. It's, only, it's the only thing that explains his disdain for his patrons. Hey now, he says as he sets the shots on the bar. Carlyle laughs. You know my credit. Our credit's good. Sir Francis shakes his head. You both lost plenty at the anchor pads. Everyone knows it. Pay now. Carlyle and Anderson shell out coins. I thought we had a better relationship than that, Anderson complains. This is politics, St. Francis smiles. Maybe you are here tomorrow. Maybe you are swept away, like the expansion plastic on the beach. There are whisper sheets on the street corners, calling for Captain J.D. to be made a Shao Praia advisor to the palace. If he rises, then all you foray 
He makes a shooting motion with his hand. All gone. He shrugs. General Prakas radi Prakas radio stations are calling JD a tiger and a hero, and the student associations have been calling for the trade ministry to be closed down and placed under the white sh under the white shirts. The trade ministry lost face. Farang and trade are close, like Farang and fleas. Nice. Sir Francis shrugs. You do smell. Carlisle scowls. Everyone smells. It's a goddamn hot season. <laughs> Anderson intercedes. I suppose trade is, see is seething, losing face like that. He takes a sip, so the warm wit of the warm whiskey and grimaces. He used to like room temperature liquor before he came here. Sir Francis counts their coins into his cash box. Mr. Akarach is still smiling, but the Japanese want reparations for their losses, and the white shirts will never get them. So, either Akarat will pay, pay to make up for what the Tiger of Bangkok has done, or he will lose face to the Japanese as well. You think the Japanese will leave? Sir Francis makes a face of disgust. The Japanese are like the calorie, calorie companies, always looking for a way in. They will never go. He moves to the other end of the bar, leaving them once again isolated. Anderson pulls out an awl and offers it to Carla. Want one? Carlyle takes a fruit, holds it up for examination. What the hell is this? No. It reminds me of cockroaches. He makes a face. You are an experimental bastard, I'll give you that. He pushes the knoll back across to Anderson and carefully wipes his hands on his trousers. Afraid, Anderson goes. My wife liked eating things too. Couldn't stop herself. Had, had the madness for flavor. Just couldn't resist trying new things. Carlisle shrugs. I'll wait and see if you're spitting up blood next week. They lean back on their stools, gaze across the dust and heat to where the Victory Hotel gleams white. Down an alley, a washing woman has, has set out long laundry and pans near the rubble of a high rise, of an old high rise. Another is washing her body, carefully scrubbing under her sarong. It's fabric clinging to her skin. Children run naked, naked through the dirt, jumping over bits of broken concrete that were laid down more than a hundred years ago in the old expansion. Far down the street, the levees rise, pulling back the sea. How much did you lose? Carlyle finally asks. Plenty, thanks to you. Carlyle doesn't respond to the jab. He finishes his shot and waves for another. Really? No ice, he asks Sir Francis. Or is this just because you think we'll be gone tomorrow? Ask me tomorrow. If I'm still here tomorrow, will you have ice then? Carlyle asks. Sir Francis flashes a grin. Depends on how much you keep paying me. Depends how much you keep paying movies and megadons for unloading freight. Everyone talks about getting rich, burning calories for Farang. So, no ice for Sir Francis. But if we're gone, no drinkers. Even if Sir Francis has got all the ice in the world. Sir Francis shrugs, as you say. Carlisle scowls at the tie man's back. Megadon unions, white shirts, Sir Francis. Everywhere you turn, there's another open hand. Price for doing business, Anderson says. Still, the way you were smiling when you came in, I thought you hadn't lost anything at all. Carlyle takes his new whiskey. I just like seeing all of you on the veranda, looking like your dogs died from civisosis. Anyway, even if you've had losses, no one's chained us in, in a clonk creme sweat cell. 
No reason not to smile about that. He leans close. This isn't the last of the story, not by a long shot. Akarat's still got some tricks up his sleeve. If you push hard enough on the white shirts, they'll always fight back, Anderson warns. You and Akarat made a lot of noise, talking about tariff and pollution, credit changes, wind-ups even. And now my assistant is telling me the same thing that Sir Francis just said. All the Thai newspapers are calling our friend, J.D., a Queen's Tiger, celebrating him. Your assistant? You mean that paranoid yellow card spider you keep in your offices? Carlisle laughs. That's the problem with you. You all sit around bitching and wishing, and meanwhile I'm changing the rules of the game. You're all contraction thinkers. I'm not the one who's lost a dredgeable. cost of doing business. I think losing a fifth of your fleet would be more than just a cost. Carlyle makes a face. He leans close and lowers, it, and lowers his voice. Come on, Anderson. This tiff with the white shirts isn't what it seems. Some people have been waiting for them to go too far. He pauses, making sure his words are understood. Some of us have been working toward it, even. I've just come from speaking from Akarat himself, and I can assure you the news is about to turn in our favor. Anderson almost laughs, but Carlyle wags an admo admonishing finger. Oh, go ahead, shake your head now, but before I'm done, you'll be kissing my ass and thanking me for the new tariff structures, and we'll all have reparations in our bank accounts. The white shirts never pay reparations. Not when they burn a farm, and not when they confiscate cargo. Never. Carlisle shrugs. He looks out toward the hot light of the veranda and observes. The monsoons are coming. Not likely. Anderson gives the blazing day a sour look. They're already late by two months. Oh, they're coming all right. Maybe not this month, maybe not the next, but they're coming. And the Environment Ministry is expecting replacement equipment for the city's levy pumps, critical equipment, for seven pumps. He pauses. Now, where do you think that equipment is sitting? Enlighten me. All the way across the Indian Ocean, Carlisle flashes a sudden shark-like smile in a certain Kolkata hangar that I happen to own. The air seems to have left the bar. Anderson glances around, making sure no one is close. Christ, you silly bastard. Are you, are you serious? It all makes sense now. Carlyle's bragging his certainty. The man has always had a freebooter's willingness to take risks. But it's difficult to distinguish bluster from sincerity with Carlyle. If he says he has Akarat's ears, here perhaps he only speaks with secretaries. It's all talk. But this? Anderson starts to speak, but sees Sir Francis approaching and turns away, instead grimacing. Carlyle's eyes sparkle with mischief. Sir Francis sets a new whiskey beside his hand but Anderson doesn't care about drinks anymore. As soon as Sir Francis retreats, he leans forward. You're holding the city hostage. The white shirts seem to have forgotten they need outsiders. We're in the middle of a new expansion and every string is connected to every other string. And yet they're still thinking like a contraction ministry. They don't understand how dependent they've already become on Farang. He shrugs. At this point, they're just pawns on a chessboard. They have no idea who moves them and couldn't stop us if they tried. He tosses back another shot of whiskey, grimaces, and slaps it down on the bar. We should all send flowers to that JD white shirt blastard. He's done his job perfectly, with half the city's coal pumps offline. He shrugs. 
The nice thing about dealing with the ties is that they're really a very sensitive people. I won't even have to make a threat. They'll figure it out on their own and make things right. Quite a gamble, isn't everything? Carlisle favors Anderson with a cynical smile. Maybe we're all dead tomorrow from a blister rust rewrite. Or maybe the richest men in the kingdom. Or maybe we're the richest men in the kingdom. It's all a gamble. The ties play for keeps. So should we. I put a spring gun to your head and trade your brains for the pumps. That's the spirit, Carlyle laughs. Now you're thinking like a tie. But I've got myself covered there, too. What? With the trade ministry? Anderson makes a face. Akarat... Whoops. Yep. Akarat doesn't have the muscle to protect you. Better than that. He's got generals. You're drunk. General Praka's friends run every part of the military, and the only reason the white shirts don't run the country already is because the old king stepped in before Praka could quash Akarat last time. Times change. Praka's white shirts and his payoffs have made a lot of people angry. People want to change. You're talking revolution now? Is it revolution if the place asks for it? Carlisle re reaches nonchalantly across the bar for the bottle of whiskey and pours. He upends it and gets less than half a shot from the bottle. He raises an eyebrow to Anderson. Ah, now you're paying attention. He points to Anderson's tumbler. Are you going to drink that? How far does this go? You want in on the deal? Why would you offer? You have to ask, Carlyle shrugs. When Yates set up your factory, he tripled the Megadont Union's fees for jewels, threw money everywhere. Hard not to notice that kind of funding. He nods at the other expatriates. Now playing a now pl expatriates now playing a listless game of poker and waiting for the heat of the day to abate so that they can go on with their work or their whoring, or their passive wait for the next day. Everyone else, their children. Little kids wearing adult clothes. You're different. You think we're rich? Oh, stop the theatrics. My dirigibles haul your cargo. Carlyle regards him. I seen where your supply shipments originate from. He looks at Anderson. Significantly, before they arrive in Kolkata, Anderson pretends nonchalance. So? An awful lot of material coming from Des Moines. You think I'm worth talking to because I've got Midwestern investors. Doesn't everyone get their investors get their investors where the money is? So what if a rich if a rich widow wants to experiment with Keep Springs? You read too much into small things. Do I? Carlisle looks around the bar and leans close. People are talking about you. How so? They say you're quite interested in seeds. He looks significantly at the rind of the knoll between them. We're all gene spotters these days, but you're the only one who pays for your intelligence. The only one who asks about white shirts and gene rippers. Anderson smiles coldly. You've been talking to Raleigh. Carlyle inclines his head. If it's any consolation, it wasn't easy. He didn't want to talk about you. Not at all. He should, have, he should have thought a little harder. He can't get his aging treatments without me, Carlisle shrugs. We have shipping representatives in Japan. You weren't offer him, offering him another decade of easy living. Anderson forces laugh. <laughs> of course. He smiles, but inside he's seething. He'll have to deal with Raleigh. And now, perhaps Carlyle as well. He's been sloppy. He eyes the gnaw with disgust. He's been waving his latest interest in front of everyone. Grahamites, even. And now this. 
It's too easy to get comfortable, to forget all the lines of exposure, and then one day, in a bar, someone slaps you in the face. Carlisle was saying, if I could just speak with certain people, discuss certain propositions, he trails off, brown eyes hunting for a sign of agreement in Anderson's expressions. expression. I don't care which company you're working for. If I understand your interests correctly, then we might find our goals lie in similar directions. Anderson drums his fingers on the bar, thoughtful. If Carlyle were to disappear, would it rouse any interest at all? He might even be able to blame it on overzealous white shirts. You think you've got a chance? Anderson asks. It wouldn't be the first time the Thais have reformed their government with force. The Victory Hotel wouldn't exist if Prime Minister Suarong hadn't lost his head in his mansion on December 12th on the December 12th coup. Thai history is, is littered with changes in administration. I'm a little concerned that if you're talking to me, you're talking to others. Maybe too many others. Who else would I talk to? Carlisle jerks his head toward the, towards the rest of the Farang phalanx. They're nothing. Wouldn't consider them for a second. Your people, though, Carlisle trails off, considering his words, then leans forward. Look, Akarat has some experience with these matters. The White Shirts have created a number of enemies, and not just Farang. All our project requires is a bit of help gathering momentum. He takes a sip of his whiskey, considers the taste for a moment before setting his glass down. The consequences would be quite favorable for us if it succeeds. He locks eyes with Anderson quite favorable for you, for your friends in the Midwest. What do you get out of it? Trade, of course, Carlisle grins. If the ties face, for, face outward instead of living in the absurd defense crutch of theirs, my company expands. It's just good business. I can't imagine that your people enjoy cooling their heads on coangrant, begging to be allowed to sell a few tons of Utex rice, or soy pro to, to the kingdom when there's a crop failure. You could have free trade instead of sitting out in the, on that quarantine island. I think that would be attractive to you. It certainly would benefit me. Anderson studies Carlyle, trying to decide how much to trust the man. For two years, they have drunk together, have fought occasionally, and have closed shipping contracts on a handshake, but Anderson knows only a little about him. The home office has a portfolio, but it's thin. Anderson moles. The seed bank is out there, waiting. With a pliable government, which generals are backing you? Carlyle laughs. If I told you that, you'd just think I was foolish and unable to keep secrets. The man is all talk, Anderson decides. He'll have to make sure Carlyle disappears soon, quietly, before his cover gets blown. It sounds interesting. Maybe we should meet to talk a little more about our mutual goals. Carlyle opens his mouth to respond, then pauses studying Anderson. He smiles and shakes his head. Oh no. You don't believe me. He shrugs. Fair enough. Just wait then. In two days time, I think you will be more impressed. We'll talk then. He looks significantly at Anderson. And we'll talk at a place of my choosing. He finishes his drink. Why wait? What's going to change now and then? Carlyle settles his hat on his head and smiles. Everything, my dear Frey. Everything. That was chapter eight. Chapter eight. Done. How is my how is my devil voice? It's a good devil. My voice. Mephistopheles voice. Very Mephistopheles. Was it was it did it was it close enough to 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 Crowley? Mm. Not quite. Yeah, it was okay. 
I can't. This one's good. I can't do a good Crowley voice. I figured he kind of fits fits that that voice. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that was an hour long chapter. It was. Hmm. That was a long one. <laughs> this one's very short. Emiko wakes to afternoon swelter. She stretches, breathing shallowly in the elven bake of her of her five by. There is a there is a place for wind ups. The knowledge tingles within her, a reason to live. She presses a hand against the weatherall planks that divide her sleeping spot with the one above, touching the knots, thinking of the last time she felt, felt so content, remembering Japan and the luxuries of Gendo-sama, and, and the luxuries that Gendo-sama bequeathed. Her own flat, climate control that blew cool through human summer days. Dan, dan on, dangan, 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 fish that glowed and changed colors like chameleons, iridescent and changeable, dependent on their on their speed. Blue slow fish, red fast ones. She used to tap the glass of the tanks and watch them streak red through the dark waters. Their wind up nature in brightest gloom. She too used to glow brightly. She was built well, trained well, knew the ways of pillow companion, secretary, translator, and observer, services for her master that she performed so admirably that he honored her like a dove and released her into the bright blue arc of the sky. She had been so honored. The weather all not stare down at her, the only decoration on the divider that separates her sleeping slot from the one above and keeps the garbage of her neighbor, neighbors from, ra from raining down. Linseed reek billows off the wood, nauseating in the five eyes hot confines. In Japan, there are rules about using such wood for human habitation. Here in the tower slum, no one cares. Imiko's lungs burn. She breathes shallowly, listening to the grunt and snore of the other bodies. No sound filters down from the slot above. Puinthai must not be back. Otherwise, she would have suffered already. Would have been kicked or fucked by now. It's not often that she survives a whole day without abuse. Puinthai is not home yet. Perhaps he's dead. The... The, fa the Fagan fringe on his neck was certainly thick enough the last time she saw him. She squirms out of her slot and straightens in the narrow gap between the five by and the door. Stretches again, reaches in, fumbles for her plastic bottle, yellowed and thinned with age. Drinks blood warm water. She swallows convulsively, wishing she had ice. Two flights up. A splintered door gives way, and she spills out onto the roof. Sunlight and heat envelop her. Even with the sun hamper hammering down, it is cooler than her five by. All around her, clotheslines draped with rustling fasin and trousers rustle in the sea breeze. The sun is sinking, glistening from the tips of Watts and Chetty. The water in the clones of the and the Shao Freya glistens, kink spring skiffs, and trimmer and clippers got glide across red ears. To the north, the distance is lost in the orange haze of dung burn and humidity, but somewhere out there, if the pale scarred Farang is to be believed, wind ups dwell. Somewhere beyond the armies that war for shares of coal and jade and opium, her own lost tribe awaits her. She was never Japanese. 
she was only ever a wind-up. And now her true clan awaits her. If only she can find a way. She stares north a moment longer, hungering, then goes to the bucket she stowed the night before. There's no water on the upper levels, no pressure to reach, no pressure to reach so high, and she cannot risk bathing at the public pumps. So every night she struggles up the stairs with her water bucket and leaves it here in anticipation of the day. In the privacy of the open air and the setting sun, she bathes. It is a ritual process, a careful cleansing. The bucket of water, a fingerling of soap, she squats beside the bucket and ladles the warm water over herself. It is a precise thing, a scripted act, as deliberate as Joe no Mai, each move choreographed, a worship of scarcity. She pours a ladle over her head, water courses down her face, runs over her breast and ribs and thighs, trickles into trickles onto hot concrete. Another ladle full, soaking her black hair, coursing down her spine, and curling around her butt. Again, a ladle of water, sheeting over her skin like mercury, and then the soap, rubbing it into her hair and then her skin, scouring herself of the previous night's insults until she wears a pale sheen of suds, and again the bucket and the ladle, rinsing herself as carefully as with the first wedding water sluices away soap and grime. Even some of the shame comes with it. If she were to scrub for a thousand years, she would not be clean. But she is too tired to care, and she has grown accustomed to, to scars she cannot scour away. The sweat, the alcohol, and the humid, the humid salt of semen and degradation, these she can cleanse. It is enough. She is too tired to scrub harder, too hot and too tired, always. At the end of her rinsing, she is happy to find a little water left in the bucket. She dips one, she dips one hand ladle full and drinks it, gulping. And then, in a wasteful, unrestrained gesture, she upends the bucket over her head in one glorious, cathartic rush. In that moment, between the touch of the water and the splash, as it pulls around her toes, she is clean. Out on the streets, she tries to blend into the daylight street activity. Mizumi Sensei trained her to walk in certain ways, to accent and make beautiful the stutter motion of her body. But if Imiko is very careful and fights her nature and training, if she wears fascine and does not swing her arms, she almost passes. Along the sidewalks, seamstresses lounge beside, beside treadle sewing machines, waiting for, evening to waiting for evening trade. Snack sellers stack the remains of their wares in tidy piles, awaiting the day's final shoppers. Night market food stalls are setting out little bamboo stools and tables in the street. Okay. Fireworks and tables in the streets. The ritual encroachment. The ritual encroachment on the thoroughfares that signals the end of the day and the beginning of life in a tropic city. Imiko tries not to stare. It's been a long time since she risked walking the streets in daylight. When Raleigh acquired her five by five, she he gave her strict instructions. He could not help her. He could not help her in Ploenshit itself. He could not keep her in Ploenshit itself. Even whores and pimps and drug addicts had limits. So he installed her in a slum where bribes were cheaper and the neighbors were not so picky about the neighboring Ophel. But his instructions were strict. Walk only at night, keep to the shadows, come directly to the club, and return directly home. Anything else, and there was little hope of survival. Her nape prickles as she makes her way through the daylight crowds. Most of these people will not care about her. The benefit of the daytime is that people are far too busy with their own lives to worry about a creature like her. 
even if they catch sight of her odd movements in the deep night and green methane flicker, there are fewer eyes, but there are idle ones. High on Yaba and Lao Lao, eyes, or Lao Lao, eyes with the time and opportunity to pursue. A woman selling environment mystery cert certified sticks of sliced papaya watches her suspiciously. Yumiko forces herself not to panic. She continues down the street with her mincing steps, trying to convince herself that she appears eccentric rather than genetically transgressive. Her heart pounds against her ribs. Too fast. Slow down. You have time. Not so much as you would like, but still. Enough to, enough to ask questions. Slowly, patiently. Do not betray yourself. Do not overheat. Her palms are wet with sweat. The only part of her body that ever really, ever really feels cool. She keeps them open wide like fans, trying to absorb comfort. She pauses at a public pump to splash water onto her skin and drink deep. Glad that new people fear little in the way of bacterial or parasitic infection. She is an, uh, she is an inhospitable host. That, at least, is benefit. If she were not a new person, she would simply strut into the into the Walamfong railway station and purchase a, tic a ticket on a King Spring train, ride it as far as the wastes of Chiang Mai, and then proceed into the wilderness. It would be easy. Instead, she must be clever. The roads will be guarded. Anything that leads to the Northeast and the Mekong will be clogged with military personnel transferring between the Eastern Front and the capital. A new person would excite attention, Particu particularly given that new people military models sometimes fight on behalf of the Vietnamese. But there is another way. From her time with Gendo-sama, she remembers that much of the kingdom's freight moves by river. Himiko turns down Thanon, Thanon Monk, Monkhut toward the docks and leaves and stops short. White shirts. She cringes against, against a wall as the pair stalks past. They don't even look at her. She blends if she does not move. But still, as soon as they are out of sight, she has the urge to scutter back to her tower. Most of the white shirts there have been bribed. These ones, she shivers. At last, the Gaijin, the Gaijin warehouses and trading stations rise before her. The newly built commercial locks. She makes her way up the seawall. At its top, the ocean spreads before her, bustling with clipper ships unloading, with clipper ships unloading dock workers and coolies hauling freight. Mahout coaxing megadons to greater labor as pallets come off the clippers and are loaded onto huge Laotian rubber, rubber, Laotian rubber wheeled wagons for transit to the warehouses. Reminders of her former life, of her former life litter the view. A smudge on the horizon marks the quarantine zone of Koangrit where Gaijin traders and agricultural executives squat amid stockpiles of calories. All of them waiting patiently for a crop failure or plague to beat aside the kingdom's trade barriers. Gendo-sama once led her, to, led her to that floating island of bamboo rafts and warehouses, stood on its gently rolling decks, and had her translate as he confidently sold the foreigners on advances and sailing technologies that would speed ship, speed a shipment of patented soy pro around the world. Himiko sighs and ducks under the draped lines of Sison that top the levee. The sacred thread runs down the seawall in both directions, disappearing into the distance. Every morning, the monks, the monks of a different temple bless the thread adding spiritual support to the physical defenses that push back the hungry sea. In her former life, when Gendo-sama provided her with permits and indulgences to move 
inside the city with impunity, Emiko had the opportunity to see the yearly blessing cer ceremonies of the dikes and pumps and the sison that connects it all. As the first monsoon rains poured down on the assembled people, Emiko watched her revered majesty, the child queen, pull the levers that set the divine pumps roaring to life, her delicate form dwarfed by the apparatus that her ancestors had created. Monks chanted and, and stretched fresh sison from the city pillar, the spiritual heart crumbed to, to all to all of the twelve coal driven pumps that ringed the city. And then they had all prayed for the continued life of their fragile city. Now, in the dry season, the sison look ragged and the pumps are largely silent. The floating docks and their barges and skiffs bob softly in, in red sunlight. Emiko makes her way down into the bustle, watching faces, hoping to spy someone who seems kind. She watches people pass, keeping her body still so that she does not betray her nature, finally steals herself, and calls out to a passing day laborer. Kathoka, please, Kun, can you tell me where I might purchase ferry tickets north? The man is covered with the powder and sweat of his work, but he smiles friendly. How far north? She hazards a city name, unsure if it will be close enough to the place the Gaijin has described. Feet some luck? He makes a face. There's nothing going that far. Not much past Ayutthaya. The rivers have gotten too low. Some people are using mullies to go their way north, but that is all some King Springs gifts and the war. He shrugs. If you need to go north, the roads will be dry for a while yet. She masks her disappointment, disappointment and lies carefully. No river then, by road or nothing. If she could go by river, then she would, she would also have a way to cool herself. By road, she imagines the long distance through the tropic blaze of the dry season. Perhaps she could wait for a rainy season. With the monsoon, the temperatures will fall and the rivers rise. Yumiko starts back over the, over the seawall and down through the slums that house dock families and de-quarantined sailors on, the sh on shore leave. By road then. It was foolish for her to go looking. If she could get aboard a King Spring train, but that would require permits. Many, many permits just to get aboard. But if she could bribe someone, stow away, she grimaces. All roads lead to Relay. She will have to speak to him, with him, to beg the o old crow for things he has no reason to give. A man with dragon tattoos on his stomach and Takra ball tattooed on his shoulder. A man with dragon tattoos on his stomach and Trakara ball tattooed on his shoulder gawks at her as she walks past. Kichi kichi, he murmurs. Himiko doesn't slow, doesn't turn at the words, but her skin prickles. The man follows her. Kichi kichi, he says again. She glances back. His face is unfriendly. His missing hand as well. She's horrified to notice. He reaches out with the stump and prods her shoulder. She jerks away, stutter stop reaction, betraying her nature. He smiles, and his teeth are black with betel nut. Mimiko turns down a soy, hoping to escape his attention. Again, he calls after her. Hichi kichi. Mimiko ducks into another winding squeezeway, breaks into a faster walk. Her body warms, her hands become slick with sweat, and she pants rapidly, trying to expel the increasing heat. Still, the man follows. He doesn't call out again, but she hears his footsteps. She makes another turn. Cheshires scatter before her, shimmers of light flushed like cockroaches. If only she could evaporate as they do. 
fade against the wall and let the man slide past. Where are you going, wind up? The man calls. I just want to get a look at you. If she were still with Gendo-sama, she, she would face this man, would stand confident, protected by import stamps and ownership permits and consulates and the awful threat of her master's retribution. A piece of property, true, but respected nonetheless. She could even go to a white shirt or the police for protection. With stamps and a passport, she was not a transgression against niche and nature, but an exquisite valued object. The alley opens into a new street, full of gaijin warehouses and trading fronts, but the man grabs her arm before she can reach it. She's hot, already flushed with her rising panic. She stares at the street longingly, but it is but it is all shacks and dry goods and a few gaijin who will be of no help for her. Kramamites are the last people she wishes to encounter. The man drags her back into the alley. Where do you think you're going, wind up? His eyes are bright and hard. He's chewing something. An amphetamine stick. Yaba. Coolie Yaba. laborers use them to keep, to keep working, to burn calories that they do not have. His eyes sparkle as he grips her wrist. He pulls her deeper into the alley, out of sight. She's too hot to run. There is nowhere to go, even if she did. Stand against the wall, he says. No, he shoves her around. Don't look at me. Please. A knife appears in his good hand, glinting. Shut up, he says. Stay here. His voice has the power of command, and despite her better instincts, she finds herself obeying. Please, let me go, she whispers. I have fought your kind in the jungles in the north. Wind ups everywhere. Hichi kichi soldiers. Hichi kichi. <laughs> I'm not that kind, she whispers. Not military. Japanese. Same as you. I lost a hand because of your kind. And a lot of good friends. He shows her the stump where his hand is missing, pushes it against her cheek. His breath gusts hot on her on her nape as he wraps his arm around her neck, pressing the knife to her jugular, indenting the skin. Please, just let me go. She presses back against his crotch. I'll do anything. You think I'd soil myself that way? He shoves her hard against the wall, making her cry out with an animal like you. A pause then. Get down on your knees. Out on the street, cycle rickshaws, clatter over cobbles. People call out about the price of hemp rope or whether anyone knows the time the Lumfini Muay Thai fight. The knife hooks around her neck again, finds her pulse with, it, with its point. I saw my friends all die in the forest because of Japanese wind-ups. She swallows and repeats softly, I am not that kind. He laughs, of course not. You're some other creature, another one of their devils, like they keep in their shipyard across the river. Our people are starving, and your kind take their rice. The blade presses against her throat. He will kill her, she is sure of it. His hatred is great, and there is, and she is nothing but trash. He is high and angry and dangerous, and she is nothing. Even Gendo-sama couldn't have protected her from this. She swallows, feeling the blade press against her Adam's apple. This is how you will die? Is this what you were meant for? To simply bleed out like a pig? A spark of rage flickers, an antidote to despair. Will you not even try to survive? Did the scientists make you too stupid to even consider fighting for your own life? Yumiko closes her eyes, prays to the Mizugo, Mizugo Jizo Bodhivista, and then the Bokineko, and then the Bokineko Cheshire spirit for good measure. She takes a breath, and then with all her strength, she slams her hand against the knife. The blade slices past her neck, a searing line. Araiwa, the man shouts, 
Imiko shoves hard against him and ducks under his flailing knife. Behind her, she hears a grunt and a thud as she bolts for the street. She doesn't look back. She plunges into the street, not caring that she shows herself as a wind-up, not caring that in running she will burn up and die. She runs, determined only to escape the demon behind her. She will burn, but she will not die passive like some pig led to slaughter. She flies down the street, dodging pyramids of durian and hurtling over coiled hemp ropes. This suicidal flight is pointless, yet she will not stop. She shoves, shoves aside a gaijin, haggling over burlap sacks of utex rice. He jerks away, crying out in alarm as she flashes past. All around, the traffic of the streets seem to have slowed to a crawl. Imiko weaves under the bamboo scaffolding of a construction site. Running, running is strangely easy. People move as if they were suspended in honey. Only she is moving. When she glances behind her, she sees that her pursuer has fallen far behind. He's astonishingly slow. Amazing that she even feared him. She laughs at the absurdity of the of this suspended world. She slams into a laborer, laborer and goes sprawling, taking him down as well. The man shouts, Araiwa, watch where you're going. Imiko forces herself up to her knees, hands numb with abrasions. She tries to stand, but the world tilts, blurry. She collapses, pushes upright again, drunken, overwhelmed by the furnace heat within her. The ground tilts and rotates, but she manages to stand, leans against a sun-baked wall as the man she hit shouts at her. His raid wa watch washes over her, meaningless. Darkness and heat are closing in on her. She's burning up. Out in the street, in the tangle of mooly carts and bicycles, she catches sight of a gaijin face. She blinks away the closing darkness, stumbles forward, a step. Is she mad? Does the does the Bacano Neko Cheshire toy with her? She clutches she clutches the shoulder of the man who is shouting at her, stare, staring into traffic, searching to confirm what her boiling brain has hallucinated. The laborer laborer cries out and recoils from her touch, but she barely notices. Not hot enough to burn someone. Another flash of a face in the traffic. It's the Gaijin, the scarred pale one from Raleigh's place, the one who told her to go north. His rickshaw shows briefly before disappearing behind a Megadon, and then he's there again, on the other side, looking toward her. Their eyes lock. The same man. She's sure of it. Grab her! Don't let that Hichi-Kichi get away! Her attacker shouting and waving his and waving his knife as he clamors through bamboo scaffolding. She was amazed that he's so slow, so much slower than she would have expected. She watches, puzzled. Perhaps he is also crippled from his time in the war? But no, his gait is correct. It's just that everything around her is slow. The people, the traffic. Odd. Surreal and slow. The laborer, the laborer seizes her. Imiko lets herself be dragged, sc scanning the traffic for another glimpse of the gaijin. Did she hallucinate? And there, the gaijin again. Imiko throws off the laborer's grasp and lunges into traffic. With the last of her energy, she ducks under the belly of the megadon, nearly cr crashing into its great colum columnar legs, and then she's on the other side pacing the gaijin's rickshaw, reaching up to him like a beggar. He observes her with cold eyes, completely detached. She stumbles and grabs at the rickshaw to steady herself. Knowing he will shove her back, she's nothing but a wind-up. She was a fool. She was stupid to hope that he would see her as a person, a woman, as anything other than awful. Abruptly, he grabs her hand and pulls her aboard. The gaijin shouts at his driver to ride. To ride. Gansui chi ne chi che. Quai, quai, quai. 
to hurry up. He spews. He spews words in three different languages, and then they are accelerating, but slowly. Her attacker leaps onto the rickshaw. He slashes her shoulder. Imiko watches as her blood sprays the seat. Jewel droplets suspended in sunlight. He raises the knife again. She tries to lift a hand to defend herself, to fight him off, but she's too tired. She's limp with exhaustion and heat. The man slashes again, screaming. Himiko watches the knife descend. A movement as slow as honey poured in winter. So slow, so far away. Her flesh tears. Heat, blur, and exhaustion. She's fading. The knife descends again. Suddenly, the gaijin lunges between them. A spring gun gleams in his hand. Himiko watches vaguely, intrigued, that the man carries a weapon. But the fight between the gaijin and the yabadics are so very small and far away. So very dark. He follows her. Ta-da! Ta-da! Right on time for a break. Sounds good. Sorry, that was just a funny term. It is, and I kind of, I don't know. It, it, that was one of those really funny ones. It's like, I know it's supposed to be like an insult, but an insult to the stutter, the stutter stop motion that they do. Mm -hmm. It's hee cheeky cheeky. It's hee cheeky cheeky. Okay, well, we're going to take a break, so we'll be back in five minutes, everybody. Stick yeah. around, hang out. More wind up girl. See you soon. Protecting my center.
Okay, we back. We, we back, back for some more Ichi Kichi. Some more wind up. More wind up. Ichi Kichi wind ups. We gonna get them. Whenever you're ready, take yes. a dice. Chapter 10. The wind up girl does nothing to defend herself. She cries out, but Barry flinches as the knife bites. Bite! Anderson shouts, Lao Gu, quiet, quiet, quiet! He shoves the attacker away as the cycle lurches forward. The Thai man hacks clumsily at Anderson and then goes after the wind-up girl again, slashing. She does nothing to escape. Blood splat spatters. Anderson yanks a spring pistol from beneath his shirt and shoves it to the man's face. The man's eyes widen. He drops off the rickshaw, running for cover. Anderson falls him with the barrel trying to decide if he, if he should put a disc in the man's head or let him escape. But the man ducks behind a megadon wagon, robbing him of the decision. God damn it. Anderson peers through the traffic, making sure that the man is truly gone, then shoves his pistol back under his shirt. He turns to the slumped girl. You're safe now. The wind-up lies inert, clothes slashed and disarrayed eyes closed, panting rapidly. When he presses his palm to her flushed forehead, he flinches, and her eyelids flutter. Her skin is scalding. Listless black eyes stare up at him. Please, she murmurs. The heat in her skin is overwhelming. She's dying. Anderson yanks her jacket open, trying to vent her. She's burning up, overheated by her flight and poor genetic design. Absurd that anyone would do this to a creature. Hobble it, so. He shouts over his shoulder, Lao Gu, go to the levees. Lao Gu glances back, uncomprehending. Sui, water, Nam, the ocean, damn it. Anderson motions, motions toward the dike walls. Quickly, quay, quay, quay. Lao Gu nods sharply. He turns on his pedals and accelerates again, forcing the bike through the clotted traffic, calling out warnings and curses at, obstruct, at obstructing pedestrians and draft animals. Anderson fans the wind-up girl with his hat. That was a really fast chapter. Nope, that's not really <laughs> <good. laughs> uh, At the levee walls, Anderson throws the wind-up girl over his shoulder and hauls her up uneven stairs. Guardian Naga flanked the stairs, their long, undulating snake bodies guiding him upward. Their faces watch and passive as he staggers higher. Sweat drips from his eyes. The wind-up is a furnace against his skin. He tops the levee. Red sun burst, burns against his face, silhouetting drowned Thornbury across the waters. The sun is almost as hot as the body draped over his shoulder. He stumbles down on the other side of the embankment and leaves the girl and heaves the girl into the sea. The splash soaks him with salt water, and she sinks like a stone. Anderson gasps and lunges after her sinking form. You fool, you stupid fool. He catches a limp arm and drags her body up from the depths. Holds her so that her face floats above the, above the waves bracing himself to keep her from sinking again. Her skin burns. He half expects the sea to boil around her. Her black hair fans out like a net in the lapping waves. She dangles in his grasp. Lao Gu jostles down beside him. Anderson waves him over. Here, hold her. Lao Gu hesitates. Hold her, damn it. Zwata! Reluctantly, Lao Gu slides his arms under, uh, slides his hand under her arms. Anderson touches her neck, feeling for a pulse. Is her brain already cooked? He could be trying to revive a vegetable. The wind-up's pulse whirs like a hummingbird's, faster than any creature her size should run. Anderson leans down and listens to her breathing. Her eyes snap open, and he jerks away. She thrashes, and Lao Gu loses his grip. She disappears under the water. No! Anderson lunges after her. She surfaces again, thrashing, coughing, and reaching for him. Her hand locks on, 
on his and he pulls her to the bank. Her clothes swirl around her like tangled seaweed and her black hair glistens like silk. She stares up at Anderson with dark eyes. Her skin is suddenly blessedly cool. Later. Why did you help me? Methane lamps flicker on the streets, turning the city ethereal shades of green. Darkness has fallen, and the lamp posts hiss against the blackness. Humidity reflects on the cobbles and concrete, gleams on the, on the people's skin as they lean close around the candles in the night markets. The wind-up girl asks again, why? Anderson shrugs, glad that the darkness hides his expression. He doesn't have a good answer himself. If her attacker complains of a farang and a wind-up girl, it will trigger questions and attract white, shir attract white shirts to him. Foolish risk, considering how exposed he already finds himself. He's far too easy to he's far too easy to describe, and it's not far from where any it's not far from where he found the girl. To Sir to Sir Francis to Sir Francis's, and from there to more uncomfortable questions. He forces down his paranoia. He's as bad as Hawk Sang. The knackling was obviously high on Yaba. He won't go to the white shirts. He will slink away and lick his wounds. Still, it was foolish. When she fainted in the rickshaw, he was sure that she was about to die, and a part of him had been glad, relieved that he could take back the moment when he recognized her, and against all his training, tied his fate to hers. He glances over at her. Her skin has lost its terrifying flush and, and furnace heat. She holds, holds the remnants of slash clothes around her, keeping her modesty. It's pitiable, really, that a creature so utterly owned clings to modesty. Why? She asks, asks again. He shrugs again. You needed help. No one helps they wind up. Her voice is flat. You are a fool. She pushes damp hair away from her face. A surreal, a surreal stutter stop motion. The genetic bits of her un, unkinking. Her smooth skin shines between the edges of her slashed brow, blouse. The gentle promise of her breasts. What would she feel like? Her skin gleams, smooth and inviting. She catches him staring. Do you wish to use me? No. He looks away, uneasy. It's not necessary. I would not fight you, she says. Anderson feels a sudden revulsion at the acquiescence in her voice on another. On another day, at another time, he probably would have taken her for the novelty, thought nothing of it, but the fact that she expects so little, expects so little, fills him with distaste. He forces a smile. Thank you. No. She nods shortly, looks out again at the human night and the green glow of the street lamps. It's impossible to, impossible to say if she is grateful or surprised or if his decision even matters to her. However, however her mask might have slipped in the, in the heat of terror and relief of escape, her thoughts are carefully locked away now. Is there some place I should take you? She shrugs. Relay is... Relay, he is the only one who would keep me. But he wasn't the first, was he? You weren't always... He trails off. There is no polite word, and looking at the girl, he doesn't have the appetite to call her a toy. She glances over at him, then out again at the passing city. Gas lights puddle, puddle the streets with low green pockets of phosphor, separated by deep canyons of shadow. They pass under a lamp, and Anderson catches her face, dimly, uh, dimly illuminated. Humidity sheened and pensive before it disappears in darkness. No, I was not always this way. Not, she trails off. Not like this. She falls quiet, 
thoughtful. Mishimoto employed me. I had, she shrugs, an owner. An owner at the company. I was owned. Jin, my owner acquired a temporary foreign business exemption to bring me to the kingdom. A 90-day permit, extendable by palace waiver because of the Japanese friendship. I was his personal secretary, translation, office management, and companion. Another shrug, more felt than seen. But it is expensive to return to Japan. A dirigible ticket for a new person is the same for your kind. My owner concluded that leaving his secretary in Bangkok was more economical. When his, when his assignment here ended, he decided to upgrade upgrade new in Osaka. She doesn't know. She shrugs. I was given my final pay at the anchor pad, and he went away. Up and away. Now, Raleigh? He asks. Again, the shrug. No tie wants a new person for a secretary or translator tran or translation in Japan only. Common even. Too few babies born. Too much working needed. Here? She shakes, shakes her head. Calorie markets are controlled. Everyone is jealous for Utex. Everyone protects their rice. Raleigh does not care. Raleigh likes novelty. The clouded scent of fish frying of fish frying washes over them, greasy and cloying. A night market full of people dining by candlelight, hunched over noodles and skewers of octopus and plates of of, of lap, they up, lap, and plates of lap. Anderson stifles an urge to to raise the rickshaw's rain hood and close and close the privacy of the curtain to hide the evidence of her company. Walks flame brightly with the telltale green sparkles of environment ministry taxed methane. The, the sweat sheen on people's dark skin is barely lit. At their feet, Cheshire Circle, alert for charity scraps and opportunities for theft. Cheshire shadow bleeds across the darkness, causing Lao Gu to swerve. He curses softly in his own language. Yumiko laughs, a small surprise sound as she claps her hands in delight. Lao Gu glares at her. You like Cheshire's? Anderson asks. Yumiko looks at him in surprise. You do not? Back home, we kill them fast enough, he says. Even Grahamites offer blue bills for their, their skins. Probably the only thing they've ever, probably the only thing they've ever done that I agreed with. Hmm. Yes. Yumiko's brow wrinkles thoughtfully. They are too much improved for this world, I think. A natural bird has so little chance now. She smiles slightly. Just think if they had made new people first. It is a mis. Is it mischief in her eyes or melancholy? What do you think would have happened? Anderson asks. Yumiko doesn't meet his gaze. Looks out instead at the circling cats amongst the diners. Jean Ripper's learned too much from Cheshire's. She doesn't say anything else, but Anderson can guess what's in her mind. If her kind had come first before the Jean Ripper's knew better, she would not have been made sterile. She would not have the signature TikTok motions that make her so physically obvious. She might have even been designed as well as the military windups now operating in Vietnam, deadly and fearless. Without the lesson of the Cheshires, Yumiko, Yumiko might have had the opportunity to supplant the human species entirely with her own improved version. Instead, she is a genetic dead end doomed to a single life cycle, just like soy pro and total nutrient wheat. Another shadow cat bolts across the street, shimmering and shading through the darkness. A high-tech homage to Lewis Car Carl, a few dirigible and clipper, ships, clipper ship rides, and suddenly an entire 
and suddenly entire classes of animals are wiped out, unequipped to fight an invisible threat. We would have realized our mistake, Anderson observes. Yes, of course, but perhaps not soon enough. She changes the subject abruptly, nods at a temple rising against the night skyline. It's very pretty, yes? You like their temples? Anderson wonders if she has changed the subject to avoid conflict and argument, or if she is actually afraid that he will successfully refute her fantasy. He studies the rising machete and bot of the temple. It's a lot nicer than what the Grahamites are building back home. Grahamites, she makes a face. So concerned with niche and nature, so focused on their Noah's art after the flood has already happened. Anderson thinks of Hag, sweating and distressed at the destruction caused by Ivory Beetle. If they could, they'd if they could, they'd keep us all on our own continents. It is impossible, I think. People like to expand, to fill new niches. The temple's golden filigree shines dully in the moon. The world truly is shrinking again. A few dirigible and clipper rides, and Anderson and Anderson clatters through darkened streets on the far side of the planet. It's astounding in his grandparents' time, even the commute between the old expansion suburb and a city was impossible. His grandparents used to tell stories of exploring abandoned, abandoned suburbs, scavenging for scrap, and leaving in, in leavings of whole sprawling neighborhoods that were destroyed in, in the petroleum contract contraction. To travel 10 miles had been a great journey for them, and now look at him. Ahead of him, white uniforms materialize at the mouth of an alley. Emiko blanches and leans close. Hold me. Anderson tries to shake her off, but she clings. The white shirts have stopped, are watching them approach. The wind-up clings more tightly. Anderson fights an urge to shove her from the rickshaw and flee. This is the last thing he needs. She whispers, I am against quarantine now, like me punching hack wheel. If they see my movement, they will know. They will mulch me. She nestles close. I am sorry. Please. Her eyes bay. In a sudden rush of pity, he wraps his arms around her, enfolding her in whatever protection a cowrie man can offer a piece of illegal Japanese trash. The ministry men call out to them, smiling. Anderson smiles back and gives a bob of, a bob of the head, even as his skin prickles. The, the white shirt's eyes linger. One of them smiles and says something to the other as he twirls the baton that dangles from his wrist. Yumiko shivers uncontrollably beside Anderson, her smile a forced mask. Anderson pulls her closer. Please don't ask for a bribe, not this time, please. And they slide past. Behind him, the white shirts start laughing, either about the harangue and the girl clutched together or about something else completely unrelated. And it doesn't matter, really, because they are disappearing into the distance, and he and Yumiko are safe again. She draws away, shaking. Thank you, she whispers. I was careless to come out. Stupid. She pushes her hair away from her face and looks back. The ministry men are quickly receding. Her fists clenched. Stupid girl, she murmurs. You are not a Cheshire who disappears as you please, she shakes her head, angry driving home her own lesson. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Anderson watches, transfixed as Emiko is adapted for a different sort of world. Not this brutal sweltering place. The city will swallow her eventually. It's obvious. She becomes aware of his gaze, shares a small melancholy smile. Nothing lasts forever, I think. No. Anderson's throat is tight. 
They stare at one another. Her blouse has fallen open again, showing the line of her throat, the inner curve of her breasts. She doesn't move to hide herself, just looks back at him, solemn. Is it deliberate? Does she mean to encourage him, or is it simply her nature to entice? Perhaps she cannot help herself at all. A set of instincts as ingrained in her DNA as Cheshire's clever stalking of birds. Anderson leans close, unsure. Emiko doesn't pull away, moves instead to meet him. Her lips are soft. Anderson runs his hand up her hip, pushes her blouse open, and quests inside. She sighs and presses closer, her lips opening to him. Does she wish this? Or only acquiesce? Is she even capable of refusing? Her breasts press against him. Her hands, his, her hands slip down his body. He's shaking, trembling like a 16-year-old boy. Did the, gen did the genetic geneticist embed her DNA with pheromones? Her body is intoxicating. Mindless of the street, of Laogu, of everything, he pulls her to him. Running his hand up to cuff her breasts to hold her perfect flesh. The wind-up girl's heart speeds like a hummingbird's under his palm. That was chapter 10. Six. Six? Yep. You know. Where are we at? Two, Two hours. hours. All right, what have we got left? Ooh, this is a long one. No, 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 not too long. Semi-long. Whew. Feeling okay? Yep. Okay. I'm drinking water, so it's helping. Good. <sighs> JD has a certain respect for the Chaozu type Chinese. Their factories are large and well run. They have generations rooted in the kingdom, and they are intensely loyal to Her Majesty, the Child Queen. They are utterly unlike the pathetic Chinese refugees who have, who have fled in, in from Malaya, fleeing to his country in hopes of succor after they alienated the natives of their own. If the Malayan Chinese had been half as clever as the Chaozu, they would have converted to Islam generations ago and woven themselves fully into the tapestry of that society. Instead, the Chinese of Malacca and Penang and the western coast arrogantly held themselves apart, thinking the rising tide of fundamentalism would not affect them. And now they come begging to the kingdom, hoping that their Chaozu cousins will aid them when they were not clever enough to help themselves. Chaozu are smart, where the Malay and Chinese are stupid. They are practically Thai themselves. They speak Thai, they took Thai names, they may have Chinese roots somewhere in their distant past, but they are Thai and they are loyal, which, when J.D. thinks about it, is more than can be said about some of his own race. Certainly more than can be said of Akarat and his brood at the trade ministry. So, J.D. feels a certain sympathy when a Chao Zhu businessman in a long white shirt, loose cotton trousers and sandals strides back and forth in front of him on the factory floor complaining that his factory has been shut down because some coal ration has been exceeded when he paid every white shirt who came through his door, and that JD has no right, no right, to shut down the entire factory. JD even has sympathy when the man calls him a turtle's egg, when, which is certainly an annoying thing to hear, knowing that it is a terrible insult in Chinese. Yet, still, he remains tolerant of the emotional explosions of the part of emotion explosions on part of this business on the part of this businessman. I can words. It is the Chinese nature to be a bit hot-headed. They are given to explosions of emotion that a Thai would never indulge in. All in all, JD has sympathy for the man, but he doesn't have sympathy for a man who shoves a finger into his chest repeatedly while he curses. And so, J.D. is sitting atop that man's chest now, 
with a black baton over his windpipe, explaining the finer points of respect due to a white shirt. You seem to have mistaken me for another ministry man, J.D. observes. The man gurgles and tries to get free, but the baton crushing his throat prevents him. J.D. watches him carefully. You, of course, understand that we have coal rationing because we are a city, are a city underwater. Your carbon allocation was exceeded many months ago. That's literally what they have for him. <laughs> JD considers the response, <laughs> shakes his head sadly. No, I think that we cannot allow it to continue. King Ramoth the Twelfth decreed, and Her Royal Majesty the Child Queen now supports that we shall never abandon Krum threat to the invasions of the rising sea. We will not flee from our city of divine beings the way the cowards of Ayutthaya fled from the Burmese. The ocean is not some marching army. Once we accede to the waters, we will never rise again. We will never... Excuse me. Once we accede to the waters, we will never again throw it out. He regards the sweating Chinese man, and so we must all do our part. We must all fight together, like the villagers of Bang Rajan, to keep this, this invader from our streets. Don't you think? That's, that's what they have. It's from the book. Look. Yeah, I, I believe you. It's just it's funny to listen to. Yeah. Good. JD smiles. I'm glad we're making progress. Someone clears his throat. JD looks up, stifling his annoyance. Yes? A young private in new white stands respectfully, waiting. Kun JD, he wise, lowering his head to his pressed palms. Holds the pose. I am very sorry for my interruption. Yes? Jao Kun General Praka, Praka requests your presence. I am busy, JD says. Our friend here finally seems willing to communicate with a cool heart and reasonable demeanor. He smiles kindly down at the businessman. The boy says, I was to tell you, I was told to, uh, to go ahead, to tell you that you should get your, uh, your, so sorry, glory seeking ass, so sorry, <laughs> back to the ministry immediately if not before. He winces at the words. If you have no cycle, you were supposed to take mine. JD grimaces. Ah, uh, yes, well, then. He gets up off the businessman, nods to, nods to Kanya. Lieutenant, perhaps you can reason with our friend here. Kanya makes a face of puzzlement. Is something wrong? It seems pra Pracha is finally ready to rant and rave at Oh, whoops. Who is this? Oh, Kanya makes a face of puzzle puzzlement. Is something wrong? It seems Prakja is finally ready to rant and rave at me. Should I come with you? Kanya glances at the businessman. This lizard can wait for another day. JD grins at her concern. Don't worry about me. Finish here. I'll let you know whether we're being exiled south to guard yellow card in tournaments for the rest of our careers when you get back. As they head for the door, the businessman mutters new, musters new bravery. I'll have your head for this hee yeah. The sound of Kanya's club connecting and a yelp are the last things JD hears as he exits the factory. Outside, the sun glares down. He's already sweating from the exertion of working on the businessman, and the sun burns uncomfortably. He stands under the shade of a coconut palm until the messenger can bring the bike around. The boy eyes J. I the boy eyes JD's sweating face with concern. Do you wish to rest? JD laughs. Don't worry about me. I'm just getting old. That he uh, was a troublesome one, and I'm not the fighter I used to be. In the cool season, I wouldn't be sweating so. You won lots of fights. Some, JD grins, and I trained in weather hotter than this. 
Your lieutenant could do such work, the boy says. No need for you to work so hard. JD wipes his brow and shakes his head, and then, and then what would my men think? That, Lacey? The boy gasps. No one would think such a thing of you, never. When you're captain, you'll understand better. JD smiles indulgently. Men are loyal when you lead from the front. I won't have a man whistling, wasting his time winding a crank fan for me or waving a palm frond just to keep me comfortable like those he on the trade ministry. I may, I may lead, but we are all brothers. When you are captain, promise me you will do the same. The boy's eyes shine. He wise again, weighs again. Yes, Coon, I won't forget. Thank you. Good boy. JD swings his leg over the boy's bike. When Lieutenant Ka Kanya is finished here, she'll give you a ride back on our tandem. He steers out into traffic and in the hot season, without rain, not many except the insane or the motivated are out in the direct heat, but covered ar arches and paths, hi paths hide markets full of vegetables and cooking implements and clothing. At the Nanafralan, JD takes his hands off the handlebars to why, to why, why, I do not know which pronunciation is, to why, to the city pillar shrine as he passes, whispering a prayer for the safety of the, of the spiritual heart of Bangkok. It is the place where King Rama the Twelfth first announced that they would not abandon the city to the rising seas. Now, the sound of monks chanting for the city's survival filters out onto the street, filling JD with a sense of peace. He raises his hands to his forehead three times, one, one of a river of the, one of a river of the other riders who will all do the same. Fifteen minutes later, the environment mystery appears. A series of buildings, red tiled with steeply sloping roofs, peering out of bamboo thickets and teak, and teak and rain trees. High white walls and Garuda and Garuda and Singha images guard the ministry's perimeter, stained with old rain marks and fringed with, with growing ferns and mosses. JD has seen the compound for the air. Oh gosh, good sorry. JD has seen the compound from the air, one of a handful taken up for a dirigible overflight of the city when Chayanuchit still ran the ministry and white shirt influence was absolute. When the plagues that swept the earth were killing crops at such a fantastic rate that no one knew if anything at all would survive. Chayan Chayanuchit remembered the beginning of the plagues. Not many could claim that. And when JD was a young drafty, he was lucky enough to work in the man's office, bringing dispatches. Chayanuchit understood what was at stake and what had to be done. When the borders needed closing, when ministry needed isolating, when when Fouquet and <laughs> Fouquet, I shouldn't be laughing at that. <laughs> when Fouquet and Chiang Mai needed raising. He, didn't, he did not hesitate. When the jungle blooms exploded in the north, he burned and burned and burned. And when he took to the sky in, a, in his majesty, the king's dirigible, JD was blessed to ride with him. By then, they were only mopping up. Agrigen and pure cow, and the rest were shipping their plague resistant seeds and demanding exorbitant profits and patriotic gene rippers were already working to crack the code of the calorie company's products, fighting to keep the kingdom fed, as Burma and the Vietnamese and the, and the Khmers all fell. Agrigen and its ilk were threatening embargo over intellectual property infringement, but the Thai kingdom was still alive. Against all odds, they were alive. As others were crushed under the calorie company's heels, the kingdom stood strong. Embargo, Chianuchit had laughed. Embargo is precisely what we want. 
we do not wish to interact with their outside world at all. And so the walls had gone up. Those that the oil, those that the oil collapse had not already created. Those that had not been raised against civil war and starving refugees. A final set of barriers to protect the kingdom from the onslaughts of the outside world. As a young inductee, J.D. What had been astounded at the hive of activity that was the that was the environment ministry. White shirts rushing from office to the street as they tried to maintain tabs on thousands of hazards. And no other ministry was the sense of urg urgency so acute. Plagues waited for no one. A single gene hack weevil found in an outlying district meant a response time counted in hours. White shirts on a kink spring train rushing across the countryside to the to the epicenter. And at every turn the ministry's purview was expanding. The plagues were but the latest result in the kingdom's survival. First came the rising sea levels, the need to construct the dikes and levees, and then came the oversight of power contracts and trading and and trading and pollution credits and climate infractions. The white shirts took over the licensing of methane capture and production. Then there were the there was the monitoring of fishery health and toxin accumulants in the kingdom's final bastion of calorie support. A blessing that the Hrain calorie companies had thought calorie companies thought had landlocked people and had only desultory attacked fishing stocks. And there was the and there was the tracking of human health and viruses and bacteria. H seven V nine Sibisosis one eleven B C D Fagan fringe bitter water mussel and there are viral mutations that jump so easily from salt water to dry land. Blister rust. There is no end to the duties of the ministry. J D passes a woman selling bananas can't resist hopping off his bike to buy one. It's a new varietal from the ministry's rapid prototyping unit, fast growing, resistant to mac mac mites with their tiny with their tiny black eggs that sicken banana flowers before they can hope to grow. He peels a banana and eats it greedily as he pushes his bike along, wishing he could take the time to have a real snack. He discards the peel beside the bulk of a rain tree. All life produces waste. The act of living produces costs, hazard and disposal questions. And so the ministry has found itself in the center of all life. Mitigating, guiding, policing the detritus of the average person along with investigating the infractions of the greedy and the short-sighted the ones who wish to make quick profits and trade on others' lives for it. The symbol for the environment ministry is the eye of a tortoise, for the long view. The understanding that nothing comes cheap or quickly without a hidden cost. And if others call, call them the turtle ministry, and if the Chaozu Chinese now curse white shirts as turtle eggs, because they are not allowed to manufacture as many kink spring scooters as they would like, so be it. If the Ferang make fun of the of the tortoise for its slow pace, so be it. The environment ministry has ensured that the kingdom endures, and JD can only stand in awe of its past glories. And yet, when JD climbs off his bicycle outside the ministry, outside the ministry gate, a man glares at him and a woman turns away, even just outside their own compound, or protects, or perhaps particularly there. The people he protects turn away from him. J.D. grimaces and wheels his cycle past the guards. The compound is still a hive of activity, and yet it is so different from when he first joined. There is mold on the walls and chunks of the edifice are cracking under the pressure of the vines. An old bow tree leans against a wall, rotting, underlining their failures. It has lain, it has lain so for ten years, rotting, unremarked, 
amongst the other things that have also died. There's an air of wreckage to the place. The jungle attempting to reclaim what was carved from it. If the vines were not cleared from the past, the ministry would disappear entirely in a different in a different time, when the ministry was a hero of the people, it was a different. It it was different. Then, people genuflected before ministry office officers. Three times, crabbed to the ground as though they were monks themselves. Their white uniforms inspiring respect and adoration. Now, JD watches civilians flinch as he walks past, flinch and run. He is a bully. He thinks sourly. Nothing but a bully walking amongst water buffalo. And though he tries to herd them with kindness again and again, he finds himself using the whip of fear. The whole ministry is the same. At least those who still understand the dangers that they face. Who still believe in the bright white line of protection that must be maintained. I am a bully. He sighs and parks the cycle in front of the administrative offices, which are desperately in need of a, of a whitewashing that the shrinking budget cannot finance. JD eyes the building, wondering if the ministry has come to crisis. Crisis thanks to overreact, overreaching or because of its phenomenal success. People have lost their fear of the outside world. Environments, budgets, budget shrinks yearly while that of trade increases. JD finds a seat outside the general's office. White shirt officers walk past, carefully ignoring him. That he is waiting in front of Prasha's office should, should fill him with some satisfaction. It isn't often that he is called before a man of rank. He's done something right for once. A young man approaches hesitantly, weighs, Kun JD. At JD's nod, the young man breaks into a grin. His hair is cropped close. His eyebrows are only slight shadows. He has just come out of the monastery. Kun, I hoped it was you. He hesitates, then holds out a small card. It is painted in the old Sukhothai style and depicts a young man in combat. Blood on his face, driving an opponent down into the ring. His features are stylized, but JD can't help smiling at the sight of it. Where did you get this? I was at the fight, Kun, in the village. I was only this big. He holds his hand up, uh, up to his waist. Only like this. Perhaps, maybe smaller. He laughs self-consciously. You made me want to be a fighter. When, uh, did the car knock you down and your blood was everywhere, I thought you were finished. I didn't think you were big enough to take him. He had muscles. He trails off. I remember. It was a good fight. The youth grins. Yes, Kun. Fabulous. I thought I wanted to be a fighter, too. And now look at you. The boy runs his hand over his close-cropped hair. Ah, uh, well, fighting is harder than I thought. But he pauses. Would you sign it? The card? Please? I would like to give it to my father. He still speaks highly of your fights. JD smiles and signs. Dithikar was not the most clever fighter I ever faced, but he was strong. I wish all my fights were so clear cut. Captain JD, a voice interrupts. If you are quite finished with your fans, perhaps not all of perhaps not all the younger generation is a waste. Perhaps JD turned. JD, blah. I skipped a few couple lines. If you are quite finished with your fans, the young man weighs and flees. JD watches him run, thinks that perhaps not all the younger generation is a waste. Perhaps JD turns to face the general. He is just a boy. Prata glowers at JD. JD. And it's hardly my fault that I was a good fighter. The ministry was my sponsor for those years. I think you won quite a lot of money and recruits because of me, Kuhn, General. 
sir. Don't give me your don't give me your general nonsense. We've known each other too long for that. Get in here. Yes, sir. Kraka grimaces and waves JD into into the office. In. Kraka closes the door, goes to sit behind the expanse of his mahogany desk. Mahogany. Mahogany. Overhead, a crank fan beats desultory into the air. The room is large with shuttered windows open to allow light, but little direct sun. The slits of the window look out into the ministry's ragged grounds. On one wall are various paintings and photographs, including one of Pra Pracha's grad excuse me, graduating class of ministry cadets, along with another excuse me again, another of Chayanuchit founder of their modern ministry, another of Her Royal Majesty, the Child Queen, looking tiny and terrifyingly vulnerable, seated in her throne. And in a corner, a small shrine to Buddha, Fra, Fra Pikanet, and Swave Nakhasathen, incense and marigolds drape the shrine. J.D. weighs, weighs, buys the shrine, then finds himself a seat. In a, in a rattan chair across from Prakja. Where do you get that class photo? What? Prakja looks back. Ah, we were young. We were young then, weren't we? I found it in my mother's belongings. She had it all these years, tucked away in her closet. Who would have guessed the old lady, old lady was so sentimental? It's a nice thing to see. You overstepped yourself at the anchor pads. JD returns his attention to Prakta. Whisper sheets lie scattered on the desk, rustling under the breeze of the crank fan. Tyrath, Konchadwik, Fuchat Khan Raiwan, many of them with photos of JD on the cover. The, newspa the newspapers don't think so. Prakta scowls. He shoves the papers into a bin for composting. The papers love the hero. It sells copies. Don't believe these people who call you a tiger for fighting the Farang. The Farang are the key to our future. JD nods at the portrait of his mentor at Chianuchit hanging below the Queen's image. I'm not I am not certain that he would agree. Times change, old friend. People are hunting for your head. And you'll give it to them? Pracha sighs. JD, I've known you too long for this. I know you're a fighter. I, and I know you have a hot heart. He holds up a hand as JD stirs, starts to protest. Yes, a good heart. Also, just like your name. But you are still Jairon. Not a bit of Jairon. Not a bit of Jayan in you. You relish, relish the conflict. He purses his lips. So, I know that if I rein you in, you will fight. And if I punish you, you will fight. Then let me go about my business. The ministry benefits from a loose cannon like me. People were offended by your action, and not just stupid for a, Not everyone who ships air cargo is Ferang. These days, are is Ferang these days. Our interests reach far and wide. Tight interests. JD stud studies the general's desk. I wasn't aware the environment ministry only inspected cargo at others' convenience. I'm trying to reason with you. My hands are full with tigers. Blister us, weevil, the Cold War, trade Ministry inf infiltrators, yellow cards, greenhouse quotas, Fagan outbreaks, and yet you choose to add another. JD looks up. Who is it? What do you mean? Who is so angry that you're pissing your pants this way, coming to ask me not to fight? It's trade, yes? Someone in, tra in the trade ministry has you by the balls. Pracha doesn't say anything for a moment. I don't. 
know who it is. Better that you don't either. What you do not know, you cannot fight. He slides a card across the desk. This arrived today, under my door. His eyes lock on JD, so that JD cannot look away. Right here, in the office, inside the compound. You understand, we are completely infiltrated. JD turns over the card. Time skip. Time skip. Drink water. It wasn't the end, was it? Nope. It's oh. Middle of the chapter. I just they're they're just jumping to another scene. So I was like, water, oh, water, water, water. water. Mm. Oh, I remember these two. Niwat and Surat are good boys. Four and six. Young men, fighters already. Niwat once once came home with a with a bloody nose and bright eyes and told JD that he had fought honorably and had been ho- horribly beaten. But but that he was going to train and he would and he would take the Hia next time. Shea despairs over this. She accuses JD of filling their heads with impossible ideas. Surat follows Ni- Niwat and encourages him. Tells Niwat he can't be beaten. Tells him he is a tiger, the best of the best, that he will reign in Krum Thep and bring honor to them all. Surak calls himself trainer and tells Niwat to hit harder next time. Niwat is not afraid of beatings. He is not afraid of anything. He is four. It is at times like these that JD's heart breaks. Only once when he was in the Muay Thai ring was he afraid. But many times when he but many times when he has work, he has been terrified. Fear is part of him. Fear is part of the ministry. What else but fear could close borders, burn towns, slaughter fifty thousand chickens, and inter them wholesale under clean dirt and and thick powdering of lye? When the Thonberry virus hit he and his men wore little rice paper masks that were he and his men wore little rice paper masks that were no protection and they shoveled avian corpses into mass graves while their fear swirled around them like the could the virus really have come so far in such little time would it spread further would it continue to accelerate was this the virus that would finally finish them? He and his men were quarantined for 30 days while they waited to die, and fear was their only companion. JD works for a ministry that cannot hold against all the threats it faces. He is afraid all the time. It is not fighting that he fears. It is not death. It is not the waiting and uncertainty, and it breaks JD's heart that Niwat knows nothing of the waiting terrors and that the waiting terrors are all around them now. So many things can only be fought by waiting. JD is a man of action. He fought in the ring. He wore his he wore his Seu Bluck amulets blessed by Ajahn Nopadon himself in the White Temple and went forth. He carried only his black baton and quelled the Nam riots of the Kat of the Kachanbury single-handed, single-handed by striding into the crowd. And yet, the only battles that matter are the, wait, are the waiting battles. When his father and mother succumbed to sibisosis and coughed the meat of their lungs out between their teeth. When his sister and Shea's sister both saw their hands thicken and crack from the cauliflower bloat growths of Fagan before the ministry stole the genetic map from the Chinese and manufactured a partial cure. They prayed every day to Buddha and practiced non-attachment and hoped that their two sisters would find a better rebirth than this one that turned their, that turned their fingers into clubs and chewed away at their joints. They prayed and waited breaks JD's heart that Niwat knows no fear. 
and that's and that Surat trains him so. It breaks his heart that he cannot make himself intervene, and he curses himself for it. Why must he destroy childhood illusions of invincibility? Why him? He resents this role. Instead, he lets his children tackle him and roars, Ah, you are a tiger's son, it's too fierce, too fierce by half. And they are pleased and laugh and tackle him again, and he lets them win and shows them tricks that he has learned since the ring. The tricks a fighter in the streets must know, where no combat is ritualized and where even a champion has things to learn. He teaches them how to fight because it is all he knows. And the, and the other thing, the waiting. Woo. The waiting thing is something he could never prepare them for anyway. These are his, these are his thoughts as he turns over Prachas' card in his, in, in his card as his own heart closes in on itself like a block of stone falling inward as though the center of himself is plunging down a well dragging all his innards with him, leaving him hollow. Shaya. Curled against a wall. Curled against a wall, blindfolded hands. Curled against a wall, blindfolded, hands behind her back, ankles tied before her. On the wall. All respect to the environment ministry is scrawled in brown letters that must be her blood. There is no bruise on Shea's, on Shea's cheek. She wears the same blue fossine that she had that she had on when she made him breakfast. When she made him a breakfast of Ge Gang Q1 and sent him on his way this morning with a laugh. He stares dumbly at the photo. His sons are fighters, but they do not know this warfare. He himself does not know how to skirmish like this. A faceless foe who reaches out to touch him on the to touch him on the throat, who strokes a demon claw along his jaw and whispers, "I can hurt you," without ever showing its face, without ever presenting itself as an opponent at all. At first, JD's voice doesn't work. Finally, he manages to croak. Is she alive? Raksha sighs. You don't know. Who did this? I don't know. You must! If we knew we would already have her safe in hand, pra Pracha rubs his face angrily, then glares at JD. We've received so many complaints about you from so many quarters that we just don't know. It could be anyone. A new terror seizes JD. What about my sons? He leaps to his feet. I have to sit down. Prakta lunges across the desk and grabs him. And grabs him. We've sent men to their school. Your own men. Loyal to, loyal to you only. The only ones we could trust. They're fine. They're being brought to the ministry. You need to have a cool heart and consider your position. You want, you want to keep this quiet. You don't want anyone to make sudden decisions. We want Chaya to come back to us whole and alive. Too much noise and someone will lose face, and then her body will surely arrive in bloody pieces. JD stares at the photograph, still laying on the desk. He stands and starts to pace. It has to be trade. He thinks back to the night at the anchor pads, the man watching him in his and his white shirts from across the landing fields, casual, contemptuous, spitting a stream of metal like blood and slipping into the darkness. It was trade. It could have been Farang, or the Dung Lord. He never liked that you wouldn't fix fights. It could have been some other godfather, some Zhao Por, who lost money in a smuggling operation. None of them would stoop so low. It was trade. There is a man. Stop! Raksha slams his fist on the desk. Everyone would like to stoop so low. You made a lot of enemies very quickly. I've even had a Shao Praya appear from the pal appear 
appear from the palace complaining it could be anyone. You blame me for this. Fraction sighs. There's no point in assigning blame. It's done now. You made enemies. I allowed you. He puts his head in his hands. We need you to make a public apology. Something to appease them. I won't. Won't? Fraction relaxes bitterly. Put away that foolish pride of yours. He, fing he fingers the, the picture of Shaya. What do you think their next move will be? We haven't had he like this since the last expansion. Money at any cost. Wealth at any price. He makes a face. Right now, we may still be able to get her back. But if you continue... He shakes his head. They will surely slaughter her. They are animals. You will make a public apology for your actions at the anchor pads, and you will be demoted. You will be transferred, probably to the south, to process yellow cards and handle internments down there. He sighs and studies the picture again. And if we are very, very careful and very lucky, perhaps you will get Jaya back. Don't look at me that way, J.D. If you were still in the Muay Thai ring, I would place every bot I own on you. But this is a different sort of fight. Praksha leans forward, nearly begging. Please, do what I say. Bow before these winds. Dun, dun, dun. And shit gets dark. Shit does get dark. Is that the chapter? That's the chapter. How long's the next one? You're at two thirty. Let's see. Definitely longer than an hour. Okay. Yeah. We're probably about an hour. We probably should just stop early then again. That yeah, seems good. I mean, we got a consistent three chapter pace, so. Yeah. Well. Three to four chapters. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's like a, a shorter chapter mingled in. Yeah, but I mean, you're averaging about three chapters for <laughs> for three hours, so. Okay. All right, great. Well, this was fun. Uh, was that his wife that was kidnapped? That was his wife. Okay. Um, you you had I remember you stepped away. Um, but yeah, that was his wife and the two kids they were talking about. I remember the kids. Um. But yeah, we we met her in an earlier chapter. Oh, okay. In in. So, yeah. Well, that sucks. Uh, yep. They couldn't stop him, so they went after his wife. Yeah. I mean, hey, they, that's what you do when you send a message. You go after the important people because the person's too hard-headed to know no better. <clears throat> but, uh, hey, that was uh, part three of Shay's Story Show. Indeed, uh, thank you, everybody who stopped by and watched. Uh, it did go up uh, a little bit. Uh, in the last hour here, uh, you had probably like four or five people watching. Oh, nice. Um, so thanks for stopping by and listening to today's Shay Story Show. We'll be back again Friday for more of it. Uh, tomorrow, of course, we will be doing Tomb of Annihilation. Uh, so you can check us out if you enjoy some D&D. &D. Um, and uh, I'll be on vacation next week, so there'll be probably more stuff to do uh, throughout the week. So just stay tuned and we'll figure it out. Have a nice night, everybody.